Hello, I'm Dave Lander here from DaveLander.com, and this is the week in charts. I was just going to thank all you guys and girls for attending tonight. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. I'm still not doing all I should to get the word out, and I need to work on that. But the, if you would like to come live, attend these shows live, I should say, and participate, go to DaveLander.com slash webinar, and I should have links down below. Register even if the link is old, because usually I don't get around to changing the date till late, the, late in the day of, or sometimes not at all. Anyway, what are we talk about? Well, current market conditions, obviously, I have a lot to say about that. Your questions on trading, your favorite stock and crypto picks, crypto. <laughs> One day I'm going to fix that. I doubt there's anything crypto to do, but we'll take a look at uh, some of the biggies real quick and any of the little ones you want to look at when we get there. So what are we going to focus on? Well, harbingers of a bottom, and I know you're probably thinking, what? <laughs> we'll get to that. Plus, market timing, where are we now continuing? I know I did a lot of that in Wednesday's show for Trading Simplified, and I want to follow up on some of that other stuff because it kind of dovetails in with some of the things we're talking about in tonight's presentation. There's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading, or as I often sum it up, all predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Thank you, Greg Morris, for that line. All right, so let's talk about harbingers of a bottom. And these are things that have happened very recently that really got me thinking about this one in particular, which we'll get to in just one second. But one thing that kind of surprises me is these armchair economists are beginning to come out of the woodwork. And one person recently said, I don't see any improvement until the end of the second quarter next year. And I just find it hard to believe that someone could be that precise. And there's so many variables that's involved with economics. And I was curious and I wanted to see what dictionary.com, how uh, dictionary.com defined economist. And Economist is a person who will tell you tomorrow why what he predicted yesterday did not come true today. <laughs> and that's economist. If there's any economist in here, my apologies to you. But it's a very difficult art. I feel sorry for you if you are one. Anyway, I thought that was kind of interesting. And here's the one that that triggered this this presentation. I started writing random thoughts on this, and I realized how much work it is to write random thoughts. I thought video is a lot of work, but writing is is a lot more work, especially when you add in graphics. But anyway, the Kool Aid drinkers are no longer drinking their Kool Aid, and this was kind of shocking to me. Someone contacted me in a bit of a panic because they had a meeting, and the guy. I'm not sure who the guy was, but the guy that runs the 401k or is in charge of the 401k, he came down from corporate or whatever and said, you want to get out of anything S&P related. And that was a, a bit of a shocker to me. And, and when I talked to this individual, I said, well, you need to start thinking about getting out of the way when the market is down 10 percent. And I'm going to beat that dead horse in a few minutes. And just think about it at least once you once you're down 10% off of all time highs. And I found this really shocking that the Kool-Aid drinkers, the buy and hold, let's just uh let's ride it out. You can't give up your position, and all these other things that they talk about to to keep you in the market longer term. I'm just shocked that that one of them actually said you want to get out of anything SP related. That makes me think we might be closer to a bottom than we think. We'll get there though. Now, the other thing that's beginning to happen is my phone has started to ring as predicted now that the bomb has blown up. Now, what do I mean by the bomb blowing up? Well, way back last summer on August 25th, this is a weekly chart, and it's right around where I had a little arrow here. I waited. Or I made sure the market was making all-time highs to talk about market timing. I don't want to come in like we are now, down 20-something percent, and start talking about how my signal was 15% higher or whatever, where it triggered, and all you had to do was follow that signal lower. Instead, I wanted to get ahead of it, and I was hoping that the people that are calling me now 
freaked out would have called me way back then. And by the way, one person who seemed to be the most freaked out and I explained, look, I'm not a financial advisor, you know, talk to your guy. But when you talk to your guy, ask him, hey, you know, in the future, when the market's down 10%, if it's going to drop to 50, it's going to go through 10% first. Should we think about getting out? And I'd be curious to see what he says. But anyway, I told her, and she's a little younger, and I said, look, you know, I've always asked the worst could happen. It's like, well, the market could go down at least 50% and take 25 years to come back. And, and her, her answer was kind of shocking. She actually felt relief. She's like, oh, well, I have 25 years. So it's like, okay, well, if you're willing to ride it out for another 25 years, then then that's fine. You obviously, and, and by the way, it, it, as I explained to her, once the bomb blows up, it puts me in a really difficult situation. It's damned if I do and damned if I don't. If I tell them to get out, then what happens? Of course, the market bottoms out shortly thereafter. That actually happened during the pandemic. Someone I, I, I thought, would never go into the market because they're super conservative, decided to dump a whole bunch of money into the market and told the broker that they wanted to be conservative. So they put them in utilities, they put them in big cap fundamental stocks and all these other sectors and stocks that absolutely got annihilated in the pandemic. So I got a panic call from her and I'm like, well, you never told me you were in the market. And if you would have told me, I would have told you no. <laughs> you know, or I would have said maybe if the bar was a little higher, okay, but get ready to get out if you have to. And as I preach, and it's gonna be hard to do one of these presentations without saying it, but market timing is less about beating the market and more about not letting the market beat you. So getting back to the, the woman who told me that she had 25 years and she was breathing a sigh of relief. And I said, I said, okay, that's fine. So you hold through this one. And she's young, so I don't know how much she's got in the market at this point in time, but as she gets a little older, I'm sure she'll get more and more in the market. And that's the whole problem with the buy and hold, by the way. As Greg Morris pointed out, the actuary tables or whatever they use is based on an 81-year time horizon. And as Sweet Brown said, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but as Sweet Brown once said, ain't nobody got time for that. So... <laughs> Anyway, the, the the getting back to this young lady, it's like, okay, well, she's she's got two young kids and a new family and a mortgage, and you have all these things that come with being young, and it's not until you get a little older, of course, you got big expenses then, but as you rise up in the company and put more and more money away, you need to think about market timing more and more. As one of my friends who's roughly my age said, and he was freaking out during the pandemic, he's like, Well, my by long term has become short term because he really wants to retire in a couple of years. And the pandemic scared the bejesus out of him. And I don't know whether he asked it or not, but he asked me what I thought. And I, I just spouted off some statistics and, and he turned white, <laughs> as most people do when I tell him in person these things. And you know, don't believe me, just look at the market and I'll show you some bear markets here in just one second. So here's my argument. And this is just TA 101. If a market is going to drop 50%, it's going to drop 10% before it drops 50%. So 10%, good round number to start thinking about getting out. And then obviously, and we'll take a look at this in just one second, but we use the 50-week moving average to help kind of knock down some of the whipsaw that you get if you just exit it every time you're down 10%. Although it didn't actually work out this time, but in the spirit, of, it wasn't really in the spirit of a buy signal, as I've said recently. But anyway, before I digress, before the only point I was making is that we did have a buy right here, but it was just barely above the moving average. And it was on the market had already been getting to come back down. Everything that I do as a trend follower is a buy on strength type of thing. And so I didn't think about the system could trigger actually on weakness. But I'm not changing the system, even though there's a couple things I'll show you here in just one second that could probably use a little tweaking. But I'm not changing it. One, because I, I don't know when I first talked about this, but if you go on YouTube, 
or my website, you could probably dig around and figure out when I first introduced this system. And it's been a few years. I know it was before the pandemic and, and way before that. And so far, it's held the test of time. So I don't want to mess with it. I don't want to try to tweak it too much. Because if you start tweaking things too much, you start putting too many whipsaw filters, before you know it, you end up curve fitting. And I was hired early, early, early on in my career, my first gig, in fact, by someone who thought they had the Holy Grail. And I knew enough to begin to pick it apart, even though it cost me my gig. <laughs> but I knew that they were just searching and the map is not the territory. The data was flawed. There's all kind of other issues, but that's that's another story. What one being that the moving averages would turn up and they were using tomorrow's price. So if you were walking through the he had manuals printed off, you walk through the manuals and looking at the signals, and if you were going tick by tick on the charts, it would actually look ahead and use tomorrow's closing price so the moving averages would connect. So let's say today's moving average is here, tomorrow's, which you don't have, is up here. Okay, if you're looking at a historical chart, if you wouldn't have it in real time, right? So this line will connect to that line and you'd see a turn up. And a lot of his signals will be based on turn ups and moving average. So this dude had what he thought was a holy grail, but unfortunately was not. Anyway, so here's the 10% line here. And this is going back to the 30s. And all I did was use the, this is a little indicator or illustrator, whatever you want to call it, in, in ACP. And I just grabbed the bottom of it. It just tells you what percentage you are away from the 50 period high. In this case, I put it on a monthly chart. And it's not exactly perfect to show you the magnitude of the bull and bear markets, but it's close enough and you get a pretty good idea. And so again, the point is, once you get past 10%, you don't know if you're going to have 80 or 90 percent. Oh, Dave, we'll never see another 80 or 90 percent. Well, God, I hope not. But the NASDAQ in what was it, uh, 2000 lost 70 some percent of its value. If somebody knows the exact number, let me know. I think it was like 77 or something. Excuse me. I know it lost 50 percent, then 50 percent again. So, whatever that math comes to. Anyway, you can see a Great Depression here and then some bear markets that happen afterwards based on this measurement of the 50 month high, okay? And this is how far the market is away from it. And you can see obviously 75 was an abysmal time, obviously the 40s, the, we had the war, right? And the 70s were an abysmal time in the market. I, I think I have one or two clients that was around in the 70s trading I was a little too young back then, but I've studied the charts quite a bit to see how all this trend following stuff works and all that try all that uh chop. And I was actually talking with like uh Bruce Frazier about that. And he said, Oh, there were some really great trends that happened. And and I guess me being a short to intermediate term trend follower, maybe I'd follow him up, follow him down. I mean, who knows? I mean, what would the world be without hypothetical questions, said Mr. Wright. Anyway, 70s, big bear market. 1980, big bear market, crash of 87, and then we had the two huge bear markets in 2000 and 2008, respectively. And one thing I was thinking about here is, is the magnitude of bear markets increasing? And when you look at this chart, and anything above 20% is a bear market, and it makes you wonder, because we had these two so close together, they were so major, I'm wondering if the cycles are exacerbated because everyone has this access, which was unprecedented precedented in the past to the markets. And I, so when I was getting my feet wet, you had to call a broker and then they had a little, uh, punch the number in the broker automated system, which was great for me. While I had a day job, it looked like I was calling someone and uh, just, you know, looks like I was doing one of those waiting on hold things, you know, for tech support, just punching the buttons. But now you've got like the phone traders, although they've been kind of sucked in and spit out, I'm sure they'll come back. There's always a new round coming along, but it's it's easier and easier and easier to trade. And especially 
without commissions. And I think these these cycles are exacerbated. It used to be people get their statements in the mail and say, oh, geez, I'm, I'm down this all this money. And then they found that by the time they got around to make a decision, they, the money had come back and, and they rolled out the cycle. So anyway, it's just something I'm thinking about. If anybody wants to take that ball and run with it, let me know. So on here, I have the 50% line drawn in. And you can see we've tagged that line a couple times and come pretty close in the 70s. And we also came pretty close in 2000. And we actually went through it in 2009. So that's that's a pretty big haircut, okay? And as I often preach, and I don't know who said it first, but I've heard it multiple times and I've said it multiple times, every asset class will lose half of its value in your lifetime. I've seen Bitcoin half. and I've seen gold half, and I remember as a kid, I had a bunch of silver I collected over the years. And when the Hunt brothers cornered the market, I want to say I had $10,000 worth of silver. It probably wasn't that much in perfect hindsight, but I think at the time, maybe I was off by a zero. <laughs> but I was I had a, a shit ton of money. I remember that, and, and I, I remember showing my dad how much it was, and I remember him thinking like, no, 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 it can't be that much. And I, and I showed there was like these travel and sales people would come to town and rip you off with your silver. I was going on one of the prices advertised in the newspaper based on the amount of of silver coins that I had. But anyway, I digress. But that was a big bubble and uh, silver halved, more than half from that bubble. But anyway, 10% here, again, if a market's going to go down 50%, it's going to go down 10% first. And you can see you can see whipsaws in here. Every now and then it'll go down 10% and then recover. And that's why we have the 50-week moving average. Now, the media calls a bear market at 20%. So you can see we've had quite a few bear markets throughout history. Uh, the pandemic being obviously the last one, and then of course the one that, that we're in now. Now there's a lot of gurus calling for a bottom now that doesn't necessarily make a bottom but the gurus don't call for a bottom until the market starts dropping and has dropped substantially so i think they're right but i think they're early which is the same thing as being wrong in the markets anybody see the big short <laughs> i'm not wrong i'm just early that's the same thing michael <laughs> my wife's always telling me that as i've said a thousand times you seem to be right, but early. Is there anything you do about that? I'm like, baby, I'm working on it. If I figure it out, you'll never see my fat ass again. Well, she'll see my fat ass again, but you guys might not. <laughs> no, I would come back and talk to you a second time. So I think this is an early sign of a bottom is that the gurus are coming out of the woodwork. Now, keep in mind, these guys predict early and often okay but they're just starting to predict now so that's what's got me thinking about we're getting a little closer we're closer to it than we have been now the other thing that's kind of interesting is the doom and gloomsters are coming out of the woodwork and i'm sure this one guy's written a book lately but it seems i've seen a few doom and gloom books out there in 2000 like right around 2000, almost 2001, whenever it was, 2000, yeah, 2000. Early 2000, my brother-in-law gave me a book. It was one of these roaring 2000s or coming prosperity type of books. And he goes, man, you need to read this. This thing is great. And he was all excited. And I threw it in my nightstand. And I, it probably got tossed in a move. I'll check my nightstand tonight to see if it's still in there. It, See if I can remember the 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 book, but I'm pretty sure the author. But anyway, he came out with a book in 2000. This one particular author, he's he's he times the cycles perfectly. If you look at his books, the coming prosperity or whatever you call it, and then you know, of course, the market tanks, and then uh, uh the, we're going to hell in a handbasket. You know, it's like market begins to rally. <laughs> so. Whatever, but they're starting to come out of the woodwork. And just in general, you can kind of the general feeling, the malaise out there. Everybody you, you meet is is bitching. You know, every time I see somebody on the streets that I hadn't seen in a while, they're like, "Oh, Dave, how you doing?" I'm like, "I'm doing okay. I'm not. I'm not 
printing money. I'm thinking to myself, but I'm doing okay. I'm like, oh, I'm I'm hanging in there. You know, you don't want to tell them that. Well, I've got one long I'm still holding on to with my uh as long as I can because I haven't gotten stopped out. That's up 80 percent and I'm chipping away at it, make a little, lose a little, make a little, lose a little, and just hanging in there and stopped out all my other longs and made a little tiny bit of money shorting earlier this year and I'm hanging in there, you know, I, I'm doing okay. And, and hopefully with a little help from me, you guys are doing okay too. And, you know, like the hokey pokey, that's what it's all about. We're not going to get rich in bear markets, although I need to quit saying that because sometimes we can make a little money here and there. But if we can survive them, then in good times, we're going to absolutely print money. And that's a secret to trading. And again, not letting that market beat you. And not trying to make something happen. If you look at my service, you start looking at the archives. I think I updated them a few days ago. So you start looking at those, davelander.com slash archives. You'll see that I haven't recommended anything in a while. And then we had one last week. Uh, and then we had one before that, the week before that. And, and neither of them triggered. And I'm just chipping away at it, chipping away at it, chipping away at it. And I know everybody's getting bored with me. But as I preach week in and week out, I wish somebody 20-something years ago would have told me, hey, Dave, sit on your hands, don't trade. Because the market is very erratic. And it's a little bit harder to trade the downside than the upside. So be super selective on the downside and all these other good things that I preach every day. It took me a long time to learn these things. But a lot of doom and gloom out there especially from the uh, the book writers who uh, who wouldn't know to know a trade of it hitting the ass. <laughs> Nothing wrong with being a book writer or analyst. It's just that when you're down in the trenches, it's a lot it's a lot tougher. Now the other thing that's kind of interesting is it's been kind of an Aussie man market lately. By that I mean yeah nah look up Aussie man if you get a chance on YouTube. Finish the webinar though. <laughs> But uh, pretty funny. Uh, I was, <laughs> I, I've seen it before, but it's all of a sudden I started getting re recommended videos. And my neighbor has a tree that's questionable whether or not it's dead. A huge limb fell on, fell on uh, his fence and my house. But luckily, it didn't do any damage. But I think the writing's on the wall. I think it's gonna have to come down. And I'm thinking, ah, we could take it down, and then. Of course, uh, you know, Google's listening in on me uh, bragging that I could take that tree down. I've got the chainsaw the whole nine yards, right? Got some rope. Got a winch. <laughs> Show help. Uh, nah, that's a joke. I'm half kidding. Anyway, uh, one of the videos recommended to me was like the Aussie man uh, tree lopping, or I think they call it lopping, whatever. Cut, uh, you know, lumberjacks cutting out trees. It is pretty damn funny. But anyway, um, he's known for saying, yeah, nah. So we had the big gap down to those one year plus lows and it was like a big nah and then everybody was kind of freaking out and what happened, the market promptly reversed. I was like, yeah. And then of course, on Friday of last week or whatever that was, or a week before, everybody's feeling great. We got the big gap up and then nah, came right back in. And then we had a nice rally the next day. It's like, okay, well it's do over of the do over, and then we had nah, it, it opens higher, sells off, and then at the end of the day, it's it's back up again. Again, a do over. And then we had the gap open, which was nice, and then nah, but yeah, we're up a little, and then we kind of chopped around last couple of days since. So you kind of connect the dots or connect the closes. As you can see, we're up, down, up, down, up, down. A bit of a, a Jackie Mason market, but I guess. I'll have to start using uh, Ozzy Man because nobody knows who Jackie Mason is anymore. <laughs> Still my age. All right, so harbingers of a bottom. Am I buying it? Hell no. <laughs> I was asked, what would it take for me? To, I'm always asked this, but especially in these people that are panicking, call me like, what would it take me to change my mind? And I can't get into Landry Light and stuff like that. No, by the way, what shocks me is these people that call me, this is their future. This is their retirement. And it's like, I, I don't want to, I don't want to mess with that. I don't want to learn anything about that. It's like, well, as I told this one lady, it's like, you know, I can sit down with you 
and in 10 minutes teach you everything you need to know. I mean, the rest is just details. And you know, you're not going to become a scalper or a day trader or a swing trader or a swing intermediate term trader like I try to be mostly. But you could certainly learn that, hey, if I'm down 10% from the high in an S&P fund or the S&P itself is down 10%, that would probably be a better way of looking at it, then I might want to think about taking some action. But for me to start getting bullish, for you guys who understand these indicators and stuff, or illustrators as I call them, I'd like to see some upside Landry light vis-a-vis -vis the 30 EMA, which has become my favorite EMA. You can see down here, downside Landry light, that just means that the highs are less than the moving average. And it's such a silly little stupid indicator or illustrator because it's it's not indicating anything. It's just showing you what's going on. I clicked on somebody's website and they said they had leading indicators and i'm thinking no you don't danny <laughs> it'd be funny if his name was danny it might be but anyway one little upside day of landry light little green squint your eyes you can see it down here upside low grade than moving average we had a little bit of a trend that was trying to develop earlier this year in fact right back in august right and then the market rolled back over and we've had lots and lots of Landry Light to the downside. One little kiss to the upside recently, but no upside Landry Light. So when it kisses the moving average or intersects the moving average, the Landry Light goes to zero. No matter how negative it is or how positive it is, it goes to zero. And I know you guys here, your eyes are glazing over, but to those watching on YouTube or on my website, this just counts the number of bars that the moving average lows have been above the moving average or the highs have been below the moving average. And you can see I've got a baseline set at 10. That's a pretty good baseline to look at. So once you get about 10 bars of Landry lights, like, okay, maybe a trend is developing. I need to see if there's a way for me to get on that trend, some sort of pattern or setup. Anyway, lots of downside, Landry light vis-a-vis -vis the 30 EMA. Now let's take a look at the 50 moving average. You're gonna have a little lag there, but the 50 or the 50, is well watched and because it's well watched it's worth watching and i think landry light is a good concept of any to keep an eye on with the 50 moving average you can see we've been red for a long 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 time and that average is starting to catch up with the market in the weekly average 50 day 50 week moving average as a as you'll see in a minute it's starting to catch up Now, of course, the 200-day moving average, we're well below that. And we have been for a long, 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 long time. 200 is a little slow to catch up to the market. But if you're doing a little bit longer term market timing and you want to know where we are longer term, I think the 200 is okay to use. Okay, I use a 50-week moving average, as you'll see in one second, which is actually, I guess, a 200 and, let's see, five, 50 weeks. That'd be a 250 day moving average if you do the math on that. But anyway, you can see lots and lots and lots of Landry light. We didn't even make it quite there. We almost did during that last rally. So for now, air on the side of the downtrend, little Landry light back there, a little red, little red, and then a lot of red for a long, long time. In fact, the market has spent most of its year below the 200-day moving average, which is kind of interesting to me, and lots and lots of downside Landry light, as you can see here. In fact, you go all the way back to April, and we've had nothing but red as far as the Landry light. So we're down to, if you look at this little number right here, if you squint your eyes, it looks like it's 126. I can't zoom in because it's not a live chart, but it looks like it's 126, minus 126. So for 126 days, we've been below that 200 simple moving average. I just think that's kind of an interesting statistic. I know you want to party with me, right? Now, let's take a look at my newest friend. I, I, I've been saying that the 30-day EMA is my little friend. You know, Say hello to my little friend. But now the 30-week is also my little friend and something that's really cool. I know I'm a nerd, but it's really cool when it comes to markets. You can see... We had some downside Landry light early this year and nearly all red since, okay? So again, we're just counting the bars of downside Landry light. See it resets here. You got one if you squint your eyes here. It's like, yeah, nah, 
<laughs> back to the downside. But you can see, again, mostly red for the 30-week EMA. So what I'm showing you here is we're seeing some things that happen near bottoms, but we're not seeing price confirm it yet, okay? And that's maybe my way of crawfishing out of the title of this presentation. <laughs> but you can see that if you take a look at the weekly bow ties and you look at proper order on those, and proper order just means downside proper order, that is, it would mean that the 10 simple is less than a 20 exponential, 20 exponential is less than a 30 exponential. I know everybody here, your eyes are glazing up because <laughs> I talk about these things so much. But you got to realize if I put this video out here, I'm going to get a half a dozen emails or maybe 50 emails ask me what's proper order. And proper order is pretty cool. I know you want to part of me, but you can see. When you're in uptrend, proper order is a general statement. You have a nice uptrend, okay? And this is the weekly chart. It's pretty amazing because the weekly caught the rollover pretty quickly, okay? And if you think about how slow a weekly chart is to move, especially a weekly moving average, it could be really, really, really slow. But in this case, it did catch that rollover. And here's the, here's the beauty of market timing, which if I wouldn't do it, if I wouldn't, doing these presentations, I, I would never have really thought about it. Although Greg did say that tops are a process, so that was in the back of my head. But when I do these presentations, I'm like, well, look, it, it, it went to downtrend proper order fairly quickly, and it would have got you out right around the same time as the TFM 10% system, which we'll get to in one second. But the point I'm trying to make is even something as slow as moving averages caught the rollover and not all the time, but most of the time, even going back to like 1987, the market gives you a long time to think about getting out, okay? So let's say we turn red here, okay? Well, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, so you had 17 or 18 weeks of no new highs in market weakness before this moving average turned over and then before we really lost some serious ground in the overall market. So as I preach, you have time but not unlimited time. So mostly downside, proper order. And then when the moving averages begin to intersect, it turns yellow. And all this was kind of by accident, but it turned out pretty cool. It's kind of like red light, green light, yellow light, okay? So when it turns, so it starts turning yellow, go ahead, you know, look right here. Okay, you're green all the way up, okay? Market starts getting, getting a little iffy, moving averages, a little slow to catch up, okay? But eventually they get there and they start turning yellow because they're beginning to meander back and forth. And then when they're red, you know that you might be in trouble. And as you can see, the downside proper order continues. I'll get to that question in one second, Harry. Okay, keep them coming though, keep them coming. Now, what's kind of cool, and again, I know I'm a nerd and all this, but by accident, when I discovered and developed this little system, and I tried to keep it as simple as possible, and it started out just with this buy line, with this 10% line, and then I added a moving average and Landry light to help settle down the whipsaws a little bit. In fact, you can see, you got to squint your eyes right here, but this low is actually above that moving average. Maybe if I use a real thin moving average, you could see it. And even though this was a signal, I wouldn't consider that a signal, but the two bars of Landry light, two lows greater than moving average for buys, would have historically kept you out of a lot of whipsaw filters. Now, again, I've got one little whipsaw filter in here. I don't want to add a dozen because before you know it, I'm curve fitting. And boy, early in my career, I did a lot of that. And um, I, I'm not going to say his name, but somebody who does a lot of mechanical systems, I once told him that his biggest drawdown was always ahead of him. And he got angry with me. And I'd be willing to bet good money if he followed his systems, he found out that his biggest drawdown was ahead of him. 
because you got to be careful. There's a lot of curve fitting that goes into historical testing if you're not careful. I would rather find a mediocre system that's very simple because that's likely to continue to work in the future, provided it's conceptually correct, which this one is very much conceptually correct. We're just selling on weakness and buying on strength. But I would much, much rather have a mediocre, simple system than something that's really complex because the more complex you get, the more you have fit your data or your formulas, I should say, to the curve. So anyway, this is the buy line or the 10% line, whatever you want to call it. It's just 90% of the 50-week high. That's it, little short formula. And right now, if I counted them correctly, I counted about three times, but we're in week 42, okay? So you're looking back 50 bars, and it's looking back like back here somewhere, okay? Eight bars from this high. And each week that passes, it's getting closer and closer to this high here. As far as look back, it'll look no further than this high. And then once you reach bar 52, or sorry, bar 50, what's going to happen is that's going to become the high. The next week, that's going to become the closing high, I should say, it's looking at. So what's going to happen is this line, and then that's going to be closing high, obviously. So you can see the 50-week moving average has already turned down to begin to catch up with price. And what's going to happen in within eight weeks is that the buy line or the 10% line is going to start dropping. Now, this will get you, the great thing about this system is that it, it will start to adjust to price over time, but it does have this lag built into it. So if you do get into a longer term bear market, it's going to take its own sweet time about getting you in. However, after 50 weeks, the buy line starts to drop. So the great thing about this system, again, is that it will start following the market lower and it will get you in at fairly low levels. Now, keep in mind, we're not going to sit around if things really start to improve shorter term and wait for this one system to trigger. But eight weeks from now, as it starts dropping, it's going to get a little closer and closer to price. Now, we might buy on an individual basis. We were looking at the gold stocks. They didn't work out. Fortunately, they didn't trigger, although a couple of them faked out. It would have triggered. So that waiting for an entry doesn't always keep you out of trouble, but it does sometimes. And I'm looking at different areas. I was looking at shippers for a while and quite a few other areas and some of these stocks and longer term uptrends. And, and believe me, I'm looking and looking and looking, but this is the hard part. When you're not finding, stop looking, okay? <laughs> Go through your 2000 charts or whatever your analysis is. And if you don't find anything, don't go through them again and again and again and again and again. As I preach, when things are good, I'd say within five to eight minutes of, of me hitting that little space bar, and now I have a foot pedal I'll use because my carpal tunnel is out of control. And <laughs> Side story, I'm going to digress for a second. I um, talked to a friend of mine, he, he had we hadn't talked in a while, and um, he's a trader, and he's on the trading service, and he called me to check in last week, or earlier this week, actually, Monday, I think. And he asked me how I was feeling in general and stuff, because I've asked him questions before. And uh, I said, in general, I'm pretty good. I said, although my 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 shoulder got really tight a few weeks ago because of the, the day trading I was doing, the intraday trading, as I like to call it, but it's day trading, let's be honest. And I said, I've, I've, I've got a little numbness in my hands uh, or my hand from that. And I was asking him, thinking he'd say, well, you need to get on ibuprofen or, you know, anti-inflammatory or something. And I said, what should I do? And he said, stop day trading, <laughs> which I thought was pretty damn smart. So as I've said before, when I when I start getting aches and pains, kind of like uh, Soros used to talk about years ago, it means something's wrong. I'm stressing too much over the markets and probably need to back off. And I actually... Today, I started experimenting with a couple things, and I've done some of these things before, but something reminded me of it, and I read recent, read one of the books on the neurology or something. I know you want to party with me, but what I did was I changed my bar colors for the intraday stuff to where it's red down and green up. I changed it to just solid colors, 
to see if that would help me from not chasing my tail. And I also, as I've said before, a while back by accident, I went from a five minute E mini chart to a 15 minute E mini chart. And I found myself getting fewer and fewer trades. And the trades that I did get worked and I couldn't figure out what changed. And then one day it dawned on me, I'd accidentally clicked the 15 minute chart. I know I've told the story before. But taking that one step further, because I went to 15 minute charts after I learned my lesson for any of the intraday ETF stuff that I do. And then today I decided to bump it up to 30 minutes, at least back and forth between 30 and 15 minutes. And I think I said this last week, I was talking with someone who does institutional support type research, but he's kind of like me, he's, he's there, he's in front of his screens. It's like, oh, well, might as well get a little trading in if something presents itself. And uh, he was looking to go to like three minute time frame or confirmation of higher time frames. And I wanted to be careful not to get sucked too much into that rabbit hole because I did put it in a three minute chart last week after this was this was at chart chart and i did find myself getting a little antsy watching that three minute chart and, and like i told him i have a what i call the one minute warning if i'm if i'm on a one minute chart something's wrong but anyway long story enlisted me to go off on that tangent i know some of you guys like the tangents <laughs> some of you guys roll your eyes but i think it's good this is a market to where it's it's so choppy and there's so little follow through. I think it's good to kind of maybe go up a time frame to see if you can get rid of some of that that whipsaw and tail uh, tail chasing that can occur. All right, so it's not the bottom yet, okay? It's just some early non-price signals. Now remember, we're price purists, but I think it's okay to pay attention to what's going on. And then when you get the signal, it's like, okay, now's, now's the time. And you might be a little bit more likely to pay attention to your signal and then come off your bearishness a little bit. Now, somebody thought I was slow to become bullish after the pandemic. Well, that was just because I was waiting for signals and waiting for price to, to do certain things. And I was waiting for setups. And trend following, you're not going to catch that exact low. And I don't think you should try. I think that's a very dangerous thing. But we are seeing some non-price oriented signals out there, so to speak, or signs, I should say. And I think it's it's smart to start looking ahead, okay? And then from a price basis, the buy line is gonna start coming down, the 50 week moving average will start coming down, and it's gonna normalize to these lower and lower, lower levels, okay? That might take a while, at least eight weeks for that to start to happen. And then quite a few weeks afterwards to get down to a buy signal. But it's beginning to work, okay? It's beginning to like, okay, we we wait 50 weeks and then now we start to trail down and we start to look for a buy. And it's kind of like trend following, but in reverse. And I guess if you shorted it, you would just, you'd have that as your stop coming down, so to speak. So it's just some things I want to kind of get ahead of. And no, I'm not calling a bottom. As I said earlier, I'm still bearish. I had some shorts show up in my scans tonight that I liked enough to show everyone else them, but not enough to recommend them as direct recommendations, but just to put on your watch list. Now, again, as I just showed you with all the Landry light, in the meantime, the trend remains down, therefore look to follow it. So we're still kind of in bear mode and shorting mode but let's pay attention for when price does begin to turn. All right, the question is, if you're watching a few picks, you probably have already talked about this, but I cannot remember your guidance. If you are watching a few picks for an ogre move, okay, first off, it's probably a good idea to pay attention to the Landry list, because I know you guys sometimes are catching ogres off of that list. I actually look at my opening gap reversal scan over in Finviz for stocks that are down pre-market. I have a little alarm that goes off five minutes before the open. And that can give you the parameters. I think with Finviz, I could just give you the link on that. And I don't know if Stock Charts has this 
capability to it. Although I will say that since I've been working more and more with stock charts, they have been able to accommodate me and give me more and more and more of the tools that I need. I use a lot of different tools in my business. And FinViz is one of them. I do have a link. If you go to my website, which I'll show you in one second, I'll show you what the link is. You can get FinViz. And I am affiliate with them. I don't, I've yet to see a, a payment or anything. I don't know. Maybe they just give me a free month of FinViz or something. But hey, you know, anything, anything helps. So I appreciate if you use that link. Okay. So, but yeah, watching the lanterns is probably a good idea. We had one the other day that looked pretty damn good and I missed it. One of you guys, or some of you guys in the Facebook group took it. So congratulations on that. The reason it didn't come up in FinViz is my parameters were set, I think, for 5% in thin viz and if the market's going kind of crazy maybe it's 10 percent I'll, I'll bump it up to 10 percent if i get too many and i didn't it was like a maybe a four percent and but a very higher price stock like a tesla or no it wasn't tesla i forget what it was amat maybe or something i don't know anyway it was an ogre okay so let me re, let me finish your question if you're watching a few pittsburgh ogre move and they are not showing and sign of not showing any sign of reversal after the morning section. Is there a point in time which you will be decide, which you decide is not going to be as strong as reversal as you want? Okay. Before I read the rest of that, I think I think you, you have to be willing to wait all day. And I think sometimes these late day ogres can really pay off, especially if it's the last 30 minutes of trading. And I have left orders in place and forgotten about them and, and walked in the house, get a cup of coffee or water or whatever, and come back in the office or on my phone. I get an alert, like, what the hell? It's like, all of a sudden, I look down. It's like, holy crap, I just bought a thousand something or whatever the case may be. Why did, I, why did I buy this? And then I'll get in my office like, oh, yeah, that was that ogre from earlier. So I think it's, it's, it's kind of a, a set it and forget it. If it doesn't trigger early on, put your order in and go about your life. Now, there are all cases where you get that gap down and then the stock kind of bases along. And if you want to get a little aggressive, you can enter a little bit lower, okay? But in that one particular case, I just let it go, left the order in place and forgot about it. Okay. All right, let me get to the, in other words. In other words, a potential ogre doesn't move far enough back until your target entry within the first two, three hours of trading. Does that influence your decision okay uh no because uh, yeah you know there, there's i sound like glossy man now no yeah uh as i just said sometimes they'll trigger a latent day and have a really big move now you're probably on to something where the biggest fake outs happen right away and by accident this is this is left over from last week but yeah maybe your biggest fake outs you have a gap down and it, it immediately starts to skyrocket higher because so many people are scrambling to get in but even a late day one Everybody's kind of giving up on it, like, oh, this damn thing is not coming back. You know, maybe I'll just throw in a towel or the shorts get complacent, and like, aha, I'm just going to ride this thing all the way into the close. And all the time that squeeze comes late in the day. Yes, it was AMAT, but it was still a burning dog. Okay, no, AMAT wasn't in my, AMAT was not in my Landry list. There was one that was with the trend that looked pretty good. It's a big, fat, big cap stock. And I was bummed out that I missed it, but I'm glad at least somebody got it. Okay. Yes, but still the burning dog. Yeah. In general, you want to avoid the burning dogs and individual issues. But if it's something big and fat and thick that's going to trade like the overall market in the sector, I might give you a pass because I know you guys played AMAT and made a lot of money on that. And congratulations. As you're waiting for a bottom, are you paying more close attention to looking for reversal patterns? No. Not in particular, okay, on a, on a one-day basis. And I know everybody was, uh, you know, doo -doo -doo, all excited because we had that, that opening gap reversal on that Friday where it went straight up. Was that last Friday? Last Thursday. Last Thursday, we had that big old fat opening gap reversal and everybody, brother, was calling a bottom. And it felt like a temporary bottom at least. And then it was like, yeah, nah, yeah, as we looked at earlier. So... I'm looking at those short-term reversals and looking to go in and play them intraday, but I'm not looking to say, aha, I want to catch that exact bottom. As a trend follower, I will be a little slow, as I said earlier, as one of you guys pointed out, 
as the trend begins to turn or when the trend begins to turn. Okay, let me let's pop over to the um, crypto, and then let me show you the link. And I'll give you as as you, if you're not here, you probably know this, but uh, I mean, if you're here, you probably know this. Everything I do is non proprietary, so I share everything, probably too much, but that's okay. All right, let me fix this chart. Okay, so let me just show you real quick. And I probably need to update this. But if you go to my website and you go to the home page and you click right here, there's a bunch of resources. A lot of them are free, okay? And it gives you a big list of things to do. And these are all the tools that I use in here, okay? Trading view and Finviz, and then obviously you're going to see more and more stock chart stuff in here too. But I do use a lot of different resources. So that's an, on the home page, and it's the big orange button that nobody can seem to find. <laughs> it's right there. All right, let's take a look at crypto real quick. Anybody want to talk about any particular crypto pairs? You have to take a look at them. The crypto market's kind of dead right now. You can see Bitcoin's kind of bumping along, okay? As Greg Schnell said, he, he had to take the bull side, the bull bear debate, I took the bear side. I, I wanted to take the sideways side, but you can see so far the trend in general is down or at best sideways in Bitcoin. And Schnell is gonna buy Bitcoin. He said when the S&P begins to rally, he sees the S&P as risk on when it begins to rally. and Bitcoin being super speculative, so that would be a risk on type of trade. What's my favorite crypto uh, platform? Absolutely beyond a doubt, TradingView. And uh, Stock Charts has some really good stuff, and especially in their ACP platform. But for now, I haven't found anything better than TradingView. And again, go to that link if you if you go if you decide to get TradingView and use that little link for whatever it's worth. I might get a free month or something, and it's better than poking the eye, right? But Jeff, I like um, I like Trading View. As far as execution, oh man, I trust these ex exchanges as far as I can throw them. <laughs> I told somebody what I had on on KuCoin. It wasn't that much, believe me, not enough to, to bop me over the head for it. wasn't much, but uh, he's someone who's of some wealth, and he was shocked that I had that much money on KuCoin. So KuCoin is uh is based in the she how do you say it she sales i could say it if you if you didn't ask me to <laughs> but it's offshore and you know maybe a kraken and i have them all most all of them maybe kraken and uh coinbase because they're in the united states uh commissions or i never added them up but you guys tell me that coinbase has the absolute worst commissions if you do go through Coinbase, trade off their pro platform. If you're trading off the charts, you're probably trading on that. The commissions there are tremendously cheaper. KuCoin commissions uh, negligible. I haven't really, I hadn't really noticed them. I know it adds up, it, but it's it's sub, somewhat substantial. But it's not nearly as bad as uh, Coinbase, according to you guys. And yeah, from what I've seen. I don't worry too much about commissions. I guess in the case of blindly just using uh, Coinbase as much as I did, maybe I should have. John Z pointed that out to me. He's like, here you're getting killed on commissions. I'm like, really? Yeah, you got a point. Ethereum, just stuck at a sideways thing. I was a bull in Ethereum for a while. I was kind of drinking the Kool-Aid and, um, you know, don't confuse the issue with facts and pay attention to price. and. Lots of land life to the downside there. Anybody want to look at any, Jeff, you want to look at any pairs while we're here? And I'll go ahead and shift gears then if nobody wants to take a look at anything. So let me do a brief market update. And I know we talk stocks all day in um, Facebook, but if there's any stocks that you want to bring up tonight, that's fine. And any new people who aren't in a, a gold member or a service member, meaning that which you have to be to be in Facebook, um, feel free to join us or feel free to ask about any stocks you want tonight and then feel free to join us again each week, most weeks, I, I should say. 
DaveLander.com slash webinar. All right, let's take a look at peace. As you can see, bit of a bummer day. Tried to rally, you know, yeah, nah, more of that action, except intraday. And it's sloppy. Uh, it's like, okay, we have a rally up. Yeah, we got a big rally. Nope, sell off. So it's just been kind of abysmal. I'm a trend follower. So if I'm trying to catch these intraday trends, it's it's kind of hard for me because I'm going to hang on until they as long as possible, and then they get a reversal. And then if I do play the other side, I'm going to hang on again. But it, it's really become a market for the most part, unless you've got a really good, um, unless you got a really good opening gap reversal like we had the other day or whatever, but it's like, okay, you got a nice sell off here. By the time you get in, then it turns around and goes right back up. The point I was trying to get to is it's almost, you're almost better off taking profits early as opposed to trying to catch that big trend. Because many of days I've been up really nicely and just not taking the profits because I'm hanging on to try to capture a big trend. My ultimate goal would be to only trade on a day like this where you got a huge opening gap reversal. And then to a little bit lesser extent on like a Friday when you had this little reversal here, right back down. Bonds, look at bonds, oh my gosh. Boy, you don't have to be a rocket surgeon to tell me which way this is headed, right? Oof, oofa. <laughs> and then I don't like the fact that we kind of accelerated the brand new lows. So bonds down, rates up, and that's just not good. I think mortgages are in the sevens, going to the eights. Ugh. All right, NASDAQ Composite tried to rally, came back in. That's a bit of a bummer. You know, keep an eye on the net net price move. Where are we now? Where were we several weeks ago? Okay, several months ago. But we are getting some sideways action, even though it feels like it's going straight up and straight down. We're getting a little sideways action. Rusty turned back down. The Rusty, the one good thing that with the Rusty is it did hold its lows so far at least. Okay. But if we take out those lows, I would become really concerned. So as a trend follower, obviously this thing is still in a downtrend and hasn't proved itself just yet. I'm not going to trade. I know you guys were asking me like, you know, when would I call a bottom or what would change my mind? I'm not going to trade off of like a double bottom here because that could, could get taken out really easily. So gold, bit of a disappointment. Gold began to rally. We started seeing setups in here. Luckily, none of our setups triggered. Okay, so we go back to sit on our hands. That's fine. That's hard to quantify. That's hard to quantify. Like, did you make any money last week? Position trading? No. Well, you know, maybe one of them that we have left over moved a little bit, maybe the wrong way. But I didn't put any capital into harm's way. And every time you miss a bad trade, you're getting closer and closer and closer and closer to a good trade. And I see it happen all the time. And, and not that I want to show my service or anything, but it's like people quit right before it takes off. And I see it happen all the time. And and that's probably another one of the harbinger type of things is that people are starting to give up. Like this trend following will never work again. And that's why it works, because sometimes it don't. You know, and that's a whole different conversation right there, a whole new conversation. Okay, uh, energies tried to rally, came back in. I like to see the energies get past this recent high here. And while we're wishing, I like to see them get past this other high. On an RS basis, strongest area out there. I don't know of any that are stronger at this particular point in time. But still a little wide and loose and not really seeing the setups. But be patient, we will. Financials, as I've been saying, I nausea. I'm kind of like, look like the market itself. Pull back and now beginning to sell off. Again, real estate looks abysmal. Utilities really looks abysmal. This person the other night was asking me, like, well, there's a utility fund. Should I take my money out of the S&P and put it in a utility fund? I'm like, no. <laughs> Do me a favor. Take a look at some free charts on the internet. And, you know, I think she has a six-year-old kid. As Rasky once said, if you want to know which way a market's headed, ask a six-year-old kid. You know, have, tell your kid to draw some arrows on the charts in the direction of the trend. All right, let's just take a look at a few more of these. And uh, if you got any stock picks, let me know. If not, we'll wrap it up soon here. Software, downtrend, pulling back. Hardware, aka Apple, downtrend, pulling back. Apple could have been one of those ogres. 
you can see right here it's kind of a nice little ogre burning dog i don't play those in individual issues although maybe in a big stupid thick 60 something million 90 something million share average volume stock i might reconsider but hardware slash apple because hardware is pretty much just apple downtrend followed by a pullback not looking too good let's take a look at the semis i like the semis to confirm the s p when the s p is moving higher and the s p is not moving higher just yet obviously and neither are the semis so far semis pretty serious downtrend pulling back and you know again don't forget about your net net where what's the low here in the semis you can go all the way back to 2021 and if they drop much further you can go all the way back to 2020 so that's a hell of a lot of trading to give up two years worth of trading almost and the s p 500 same sort of argument there too obviously okay you can go all the way back here to 2021 late 2021 anybody who bought stocks late 2021 is a hurt and pop okay think about the psychology involved anyway i think that's i think that's it any other questions any stock picks we could of course we pick them up tomorrow but anybody who's not in facebook feel free to ask all right going once going twice all right well i want to thank everybody for attending i appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule thanks for showing up appreciate that very much anything unanswered davelander.com slash contact and i think that's it you're welcome and may the trend be with you